Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to you all. This is Gabrielle Pricknetti from Get a Cloud. I will be moderating this webinar. The topic of this webinar is integrated business planning for make to order industries. The complexities inherent in managing make to order supply chains amaze me. And it is fascinating to see how integrated business planning solutions can bring so much value to our clients. Although we have helped customers from make to stock side equally, today's webinar is focused on make to order industries. Before I introduce the panelists and the agenda, let me walk you through some housekeeping items. All attendees' microphones will stay muted during the content sections of this webinar. However, please feel free to use the Q&A text option throughout the webinar, and our panelists will be happy to respond real time to your questions. Additionally, you can also interact with panelists and other attendees at any time through the chat text option, as seen on the screen. Towards the end, we will have a live Q&A session where you'll be able to request to unmute your mic and interact live with the panelists. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be publicly posted shortly on Get a Cloud's website and YouTube channel, along with SAP's IBP help website in their upcoming and past webinar section. So let me introduce the panelists to you now. It is my pleasure to introduce the customer panelists from Varian Medical. Please welcome Kevin Lau, who heads the global sales and operations planning team at Varian Medical. Kevin was the business lead for the SAP IBP implementation that Gita Cloud delivered earlier this year. It is my pleasure to also introduce Marcus Vogel from Varian Medical. Marcus leads the business transformation team for the supply chain function and was the IT lead for the IBP implementation. Both Kevin and Marcus led the implementation from the front and we appreciate the continuing strong partnership and support from them for this webinar. I would also like to welcome Ashutosh Bansal, president, owner and CEO of Gita Cloud. Gita Cloud is self-funded, privately owned, and grew by more than 100% this year, despite the COVID pandemic. Gita Cloud has led five IBP engagements in the US just this year. And we are proud to present the success story of one of those five customers today in the terms of Varian Medical. A key element of Gita Cloud's success is our strong SAP partnership. It is my pleasure to welcome Eric Simonson from SAP. Eric is a veteran in the supply chain domain and owns the response and supply solution from SAP. We have a packed agenda today. So let me walk you through how the next 90 minutes are going to flow. We are almost done with my kickoff piece. Next, we will go to Kevin who will take us through the SNOP process maturity journey and the larger business transformation initiative at Varian Medical. Marcus will take the floor afterwards and will walk us through some of the challenges with planning a high complexity and build and low shipment volume configure to order business that Varian is. Marcus will also walk us through their software evaluation process, why they chose SAP IBP and their system integrator evaluation process, why they chose Gita Cloud. Ashutosh will present next and has a detailed design showcase focus on IBP for MTO, leveraging solution elements from Varian IBP SNOP time series implementation and other IP, IBP response and supply order-based planning implementation Gita Cloud has delivered. Following that, we will go to Eric who present the SAP IBP latest roadmap hot off the presses. We will wrap up the webinar with a live Q&A. Thanks again for your time and let's jump right in. Kevin, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, to share our journey uh, with SNOP IBP. Hmm. Um, hang on one second, please. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, hang on one second, I'm having a technical issue. Okay. Uh, just, just to start off, I'm very proud to be a part of a company that enables a world without the fear of cancer uh, with our products and our services. Uh, start off with a little bit of an overview of Varian, where a, a, um, our products service many, many patients at the moment with cancer. We are a company that starts and ends with our patients, and we measure our success primarily through our net promoter score, which really is the best indication of how our customer facing uh, services uh, perform. In addition to that, we do have a focus, a very heavy focus on our employees. Our vision moving forward is to double the cancer patients uh, we impact from 4 million to 6 million and to build a $4 billion cancer company. A little bit more about our overview. You see on the right that we are a global company with a footprint across three continents. And on the left, what I wanna point out is that we are a capital equipment based company with over 8,500 linear accelerators in our install base. We started our journey with SNOP about 18 months ago, and the primary driver behind that journey was to drive scalability and a growth through a need, through a need for a structured, formalized and institutionalized process. I was brought on to design and execute an SNOP process and to find a roadmap that would take us to where we were to a world-class process. We started by designing a very traditional Ollie White five-step SNOP process, as you see on the screen. Five steps consisting of our new products, new activities and geo forecasting. Uh, second, uh, step number two, a focus on aggregating a demand forecast for planning then moving into supply planning. And step number four being integrated financial reconciliation where we were able to align our demand and supply to a financial plan, identify and assess gaps. And then finally closing out with a monthly executive SNOP review where we're successfully able to articulate scenarios, trade-offs, make key decisions, develop contingency and mitigation planning all with the intent of balancing our supply and our inventories to ensure that our customers get the products when they need it and for Varian to perform and to meet financial expectations. I'm gonna talk through some of the various maturities of our process, where we were, where we are and where we're headed, but most importantly, the role that IBP plays and why we decided to move forward with an IBP implementation. Just to gloss over this slide very quickly, IBP and SNOP touches the entire supply chain where we start with a plan function, understanding our demand profiling, doing our supply recommendations, enabling and supporting the factory in terms of rough cut capacity planning, and also again, managing our inventory planning and our projections to ensure that we have the right levels of inventory when we need it. We go into the make section next, our support for, in terms of the master production schedule and supporting the manufacturing execution of the builds. Uh, in, installation is a key piece and uh, revenue recognition associated with that. So then again, we have a significant uh, population of installers around the world coordinating when and where product needs to be installed is a key part of our SNOP process. And then finally, uh, making sure that the customer's unit is fully delivered and installed and operational at the time they need it to continue to service their cancer patients. The slide here really talks through our primary needs, uh, drivers, and again, where we started. So 18 months ago, I think this is a really good depiction of where we, are, where we were in terms of an SNOP process. We did have a skeleton process in place, but it was quite 
compartmentalized, it was disconnected, it was fragmented. So many of the functions were being performed, but, there, it, but it really wasn't in a cohesive manner. We have very poor data, demand data integrity. I really point out demand data integrity, but the reality is that we had some, some gaps and some issues overall with data integrity to a point where we could not sufficiently and effectively make good decisions around the business and our customers. With respect to demand uh, itself, we found that the demand inputs and forecasting capabilities were very limited, not representative of all the key stakeholders, including the commercial teams, supply and demand teams, the financial teams, and so forth. So the, the, the fragmented nature of that demand input really prevented us from uh, aligning on a consensus demand profile and uh, uh, limited our ability to plan effectively in the long term. We did not have key and relevant metrics to monitor the effectiveness of the process. It's a, it's a, it's a significant focus that we have today. We also found that the process as it existed was extremely resource intensive. It was manual, it was offline. I think many people have the same uh, experience where we manage the business through various spreadsheets and various tools. We had no system of record other than what we kept in some of these offline uh, Excel sheets and so forth. And overall, I think the process lacked some credibility and uh, really led to some, some questions around uh, whether we were making uh, good decisions. What we wanted to do was to solve some of the, the problems through, uh, use, through the use and implementation of IBP, really to drive the integration and synchronization of a comprehensive SNOP process. And since we've done that, we've seen some significant improvement around our ability to aggregate and analyze data from across many elements and areas, including our SAP, our ERP SAP system, our CRM, salesforce.com system, financial projections, commercial intelligence, all of that now is in one cohesive and easy to understand and easier to digest format. We've also added some significant additional analytical abilities around forecasting. We did not have a statistical forecasting uh, process uh, to, to allow us to extrapolate over longer horizons. And that horizon now is uh, two years. We did not have the ability to generate scenarios, but with IBP, we become a, a more capable in terms of generating scenarios and making trade-off decisions, presenting that to the business. We now have a single source of truth with a data repository that is our system of record that we can refer back to, that we can use as statistical historical data. And we're now able to drive data in fact-based decision-making. Uh, the, the human resource and labor intensiveness, we've found that we've been able to eliminate a, a, a high amount of waste, improve our process efficiency and productivity through system and process automation. So really our journey is really at the, the front. As I said, it's been about 18 months, but we've seen a great leaps and strides with the maturity of our process, with the effectiveness of it. And IBP is playing a big part of that uh, focus and goal for us. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Marcus to talk through some of the technical details around the implementation. So uh, my name is Marcus Vogel. Um, as introduced before by Gabby, um, I'm more, I'm leading the business transformation team um, in the supply chain manufacturing space um, at Varian. So I was the, the IT counterpart, if you will, for, for Kevin and um, my team together with Guitar Cloud as a, as a, as a partner. Um, we essentially helped um, putting the system in place and implementing I, IVP at, at Varian. Let's see. All right. Um, on my slide deck, um, I want to go through maybe a little more technical than, than Kevin explained, um, but more, more about the details of explaining our product, um, about the challenges around it, um, 
And um, specifically our, our Finnish good, good product, I have the next slide where I want to explain a little bit what Varian is actually building and what we're selling and the sales order complexity around that. Um, then the demand uncertainty and volatility, we are a, to a large extent at least um, in our hardware side, a capital um, equipment manufacturer, if you will. Um, that goes along with construction. Um, a lot of times on, um, on the customer side with um, hefty financing um, requirements, with um, more involved installation procedures and all of that um, attributes to, to certain, uncer uh, certain uncertainty um, of our demand numbers. Um, while we have sales orders in the system, um, because we are, we're dealing in a high volume, uh, high value, low volume environment, um, we have sales orders in the system that go probably two years out, but the dates of those sales orders are very volatile and, and largely construction driven, um, as Dika mentioned. And lastly, um, the planning process itself. Um, we do have, as Kevin mentioned, um, the demand planning process is fairly new at Varian. Um, so Kevin mentioned 18 months. Um, ago when his team started um, trying to build an SNOP process up um, at Varian, which was, um, I think, still fairly, fairly disconnected um, before we went into IBP. While, they, um, while Kevin's team tried to build the different, uh, bring the different teams together, accounting finance, um, supply and demand planning, um, it was still very much spreadsheet, um, meeting or maybe even tribal knowledge driven to, to some extent. Um, and that's true for the, maybe less so much so much for the demand planning side, but, but much more on the supply planning side. So what we tried with IBP is, is um, setting the stage with um, IBP SNOP as a first phase, if you will, um, to introduce a cohesive tool to bring those different viewpoints points together. Um, I'm going to the next slide. Um, what I try to do here is just outline, um, and it's setting the stage essentially um, of what Varian is doing and outlining the product complexity in, in one example. So what you see on the left side here is uh, one of our main products. It's a two beam, that's a linear accelerator. Um, the picture is probably as it is installed um, in a hospital. Um, if you've never seen that, that product, that's actually a good thing um, because this is a radiation treatment machine for cancer patients. So we all hope that um, we don't have a lot of touch points with the product in real life. But um, what you see here is you can already tell it's made up of different components. Um, and while the main machine, um, which is hiding on the left hand side behind all those covers, is essentially a make to stock machine and all the sub components are made to stock. Um, components, including the couch, um, the couch base, um, and, and some accessory parts. Um, it translates due to our um, multitude of accessories and components and customization options. Um, some are hardware, some are software driven. It translates um, essentially into multiple thousand product variants when we sell this machine. So from a, from a super bomb, um, when you talk about make to order um, from a super bomb um, point of view, we have roughly 300 components or, or line items, if you will, um, on the sales order side, which we can mix and match um, with constraints, of course, um, through varying configuration. And we have roughly the same amount um, of components on the production order side. And as I said, um, the combination, the various combinations of those um, translated into 25 100 product variants, which we ultimately loaded into IBP when we went live. Um, going a little more deeper into the planning complexities, um, just to give um, a little more flavor to some of those things. Um, I mentioned already the high variab variability of product is a, is a big, 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 big topic. Um, we, we essentially sell, in, in the case of a true beam, a single configurable material. <clears throat> which, uh, as you saw in the previous slide, can translate into, can be made up um, of roughly 15 different core machines, which we build in our factories. 
um, plus all the accessories. And we multiply that by five because we have five main hardware products um, currently, which, which fall into that, that product. So the, the variability is, is really very high. Um, on the forecasting side, uh, when you deal with capital equipment, um, you have usually long lead times, you have special agreements in place um, with the, uh, which have to do with financing, you have um, specific export regulations or import regulations in place because you deal with radiation and all the um, local health authorities. Um, so all that leads to a almost a disconnect between um, a revenue forecast and the ship forecast, um, which we have. So um, we have it fairly often that um, depending on the terms of the contract, which can be somewhat unique by sales order, um, we have to ship a product and have to make it available for shipment in one period or one month. And um, we can only recognize revenue a month later. Um, but what, what brings really the complexity in is that it, it's, it is fairly sales order driven or region driven. So there's no core rule um, around the globe, which we have, plus the date uncertainty, which I already, already mentioned. And then you pair that with, um, with line items that need to ship ahead of the machine because they're required for construction. Um, there are certain things um, like our base frames where the machine sits on, which potentially go six months um, out onto the field before the actual machine goes out. So all that attributes to, to a rather complicated world um, when you want to try to depict a revenue forecast versus ship forecast. Um, sales order structure, <coughs> I mentioned. Um, because of that, that relatively complex product, um, our sales orders have roughly, um, it, it's not rare that our sales orders have a thousand line items. Um, but that's also because um, in the system we are in, we do split up sales order line items by, by functionality, of course. Um, and we have a large set of revenue, um, non-shippable related items. We have shippable, shippable related items. We have licensed software items. And we have a multiple multi-level uh, variant configuration. Um, one thing I want to call out here is, um, while we call it make to order because the concept we're using is make to order on the SAP side, I do consider um, Variant essentially more of a kit to order um, company. So we use make to order, the make to order concept specifically for kitting in the warehouse. Um, everything we do in the factories is essentially make to stock. <clears throat> On the supply planning side, um, the, the biggest issue we have um, on the supply planning side is is we do have bad data integrity and, and it comes mainly down to, to the sales order dates um, because of the fluctuations we have, um, because of delays in construction and financing, um, keeping our sales order dates um, up to date to reflect reality is, is a large undertaking. Um, because of that, those, those unreliable dates, um, supply chain, I think, introduced or, or this, this habit um, over many, many years that they, they essentially walk away from, from SAP um, and they go largely into spreadsheet planning mode. And that's, that's one of the things we try to tackle with, with IDP. And we, we're still on a journey to do that, to make that better. Um, the other thing is um, machine and option mix calculations or attach rates. Um, you're going to see um, we have that all calculated manually. We use planning bombs for all the accessories, which are only updated twice a year. Um, we don't really use capacity information. Um, so with IVP, we're making this a lot more visible, um, but we're not at a stage yet where we can actually utilize um, capacity information in, in any fashion. But we're, we're on a journey to get there. And lastly, um, Disconnected systems and data sets, um, as mentioned before, we do have uh, Salesforce as our CRM system, which operates on a different data set, on a different lack of granularity. Um, so Salesforce does not have all the bill of material which we require on the SAP side. So that does um, come with certain complexities. And sorry, I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit. Um, I don't want to take up too much time um, away from Ashutosh. Um, on this slide, um, I thought it might be interesting for the audience to understand how long the project took to implement IVP SNOP um, at Varian. 
So from initialization, where we um, ultimately evaluated Kinexis and um, IDP um, in 2019, mid 2019, um, we ended up with IDP because um, we are traditionally an SAP shop. And um, I don't think we saw any lack, uh, any, any big advantage um, on the Kinexis side. Um, to, to go that route um, compared to SAP IBP. Um, plus we also worked extensively with SAP to understand their roadmap um, on IBP and future functionality. Um, when it comes to system integrator, um, two words, right? Why we chose Gita Cloud. Um, we, we started working with them um, right around October, probably October, November, 2019 and um, I think what convinced us ultimately was the dedication and the level of detail um, they presented to all the during all the exploration workshops um, to even get to a solution proposal. So that they really took a lot of time to understand our business process, to look at our data, um, to understand our pain points, and there was pretty much tailor-made. Um, demos, multiple demos and proof of concepts um, because we were hammering so hard on this make to order concept um, and on our complicated uh, sales order structure. So ultimately, um, once they start, once they convinced us um, with, with that, um, we started our journey in March and um, went live in September. And currently we are essentially in dual use mode, um, which we're hoping to abandon then um, sometime early next year. Um, dual use is really just because it's a, it's a rather critical function to control business and you want to make sure the numbers um, between the process that our executives are used to be seeing and the new IDP process are, are really a match um, before we absolutely confidently switch over. And um, starting 2022, um, we are currently on a, on a transformational journey on, on our quote to cash side. And as part of that, um, we are Planning on looking, uh, planning on implementing uh, IDP response and supply, because we're revamping all our sales orders and the, the code to cash process, and it seems just to be the right and opportune time to implement um, supply and response along with that. Um, long term, IDP inventory might be interesting, um, but we'll have to see where the journey goes on that one. Um, lastly. Um, one more minute, um, success drivers. I don't want to go into every detail, but what I do think I want to call out is um, what, what helped tremendously in our case is this whole approach of prototyping early and demonstrate often. Um, I think the Gita Cloud team with their agile approach during the build phase and, and even during the exploration phase in the beginning of the process um, to demo a lot from their system and, and brainstorm with us and showcase things in the system and, and understand the process and mock up a, a template real quick um, to, to talk through something. I think this, this ultimately paid off. Um, I, would, I would call out as the biggest, um, the biggest piece uh, of success. Um, and on the lesson learned side, um, one thing we did run into is um, we started our master data track too late. So that's, that's something I definitely would call out. Um, to not neglect the master data changes, which might be required um, as part of such a process change. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm calling out here, SAP does not support varying configuration in standard yet. That is in the context of IBP, <coughs> of course. So ultimately don't, don't underestimate the, the level of customization, I think, which are required on the interfacing side um, to, to get this um, done in a way to achieve your desired granularity of visibility. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's it from my side. Um, as we said, uh, questions are at the end. Um, so I think I'm just gonna pass on the baton to Ashutosh and let him run through a demo. Thanks, Marcus, that was great. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Hope everyone can see it. So I will just take you guys through uh, a design showcase, uh, more, uh, more than a solution showcase, where the concepts are pretty uh, complex and involved. So we decided uh, as a team to use simple examples and walk through a subset of scenarios. Some of them that were implemented at Varian uh, 
given variants uh, still looking to do order based planning next some order based planning scenarios are from other customers but let's uh, jump right in before we go into the use case scenario specific details i do want to paint an overall picture and before we go there let's just for folks that are not familiar with Kida Cloud, just a quick one slider. We've had, uh, as you can see, uh, tremendous traction in this uh, make to order space. Some of those make to order customers, uh, where it included, are listed here. Uh, we, in terms of who we are, focus on uh, being a uh, digital supply chain and digital co specialist partner for SAP. We sell SAP software and uh, implement SAP software globally with a focus on uh, planning and scheduling related pieces. So SAP IBP, uh, S4, whether it comes to PPDS, MRP, uh, Advanced ADP, et cetera, SAP Analytics Cloud, Ariba, Supply Chain Collaboration, those are all areas we play in. We uh, have gathered over the last uh, two to three years a niche expertise in IBP response and supply, especially the order-based planning piece. We founded uh, the company back in 2015. The philosophy was to deliver significant economic value to our customers through integrated business planning transformation. And the focus is on not just uh, deploying uh, vanilla, but uh, bringing in innovation uh, resulting in very highly tailored solutions uh, as a way to guarantee a uh, very competitive edge and uh, business value to customers. Companies headquarter in San Francisco Bay Area. We do have offices uh, and presence in uh, India and uh, Canada as well at this point. We have helped customers globally on all Continent so helped SAP sell and deliver. Uh, supply chain is a topic we play across industries. From an offering perspective, also we have a very end-to-end -end, uh, plate uh, discovery uh, right up front, uh, helping you understand uh, in terms of business case value with your data, with SAP IVP functionality, what kind of uh, KPI lift you could be looking at. So instead of just doing uh, function feature focus, proof of concepts, uh, turning this into a bottoms up uh, value assessment, we do that. We can also do project audits and design reviews if you are either live and would like uh, someone to look at your design or are in flight and would like a design review. Implementation services uh, across all these areas I mentioned earlier. And also managed services, planning as a service is what we call it, where customers are looking uh, to us to take uh, demand forecasting or inventory optimization as a uh, monthly or quarterly service. So we can uh, support your journey wherever you might be. So let's uh, jump into the design showcase. I'm going to go through uh, a process map and a solution architecture up front. So you have sort of an overall per side view of the planning process as relevant to MTO. We will then jump into individual scenarios. We picked five of them. So attach rates, uh, range forecasting, revenue forecasting with revenue recognition rule set, purchase order based supply collaboration, any demand management uh, capability where planners can override ADP commitments from IBP and so on. So those are the five that we selected for this. We will continue this uh, MTO webinar series. There are many other scenarios and uh, next year uh, as part of the series, we will bring some more out. And then uh, a lot of this uh, has been packaged. It's been, uh, uh, like Marcus was saying, it, it took a lot the first time, it shouldn't take a lot the second time. So a lot of this is now being packaged in a key the cloud value now MTO extension that, that enables uh, other customers to uh, consume the innovation much faster. So I'll cover that as well. So let's look at the overall uh, planning process. Uh, as you can see on the right, there are uh, quarterly inventory optimization cycles, monthly tactical SNOP cycles and weekly what we call sales and operations execution, Gartner term, uh, or operational planning cycles with IPP, response and supply. The boxes in dark blue are all this weekly boxes. The boxes in light blue are the monthly, right? And the inventory piece is in yellow. So if you think about a uh, typical SNOP cycle, the way Kevin was explaining it, they have a demand uh, generation and consensus piece. So you can have the marketing department, product marketing team or demand planners, look at uh, the finished code in various kind of kit uh, to order business. They want to understand the attached rates. I'll jump in detail all of these later. Sales forecasting and marketing are kind of parallel processes resulting into a consensus signal. 
we uh, convert the finished code configurable forecast into a corresponding uh, sub-assembly or component level safety stock calculation and review, take it through a forecast consumption process to send a, a net of uh, orders open forecast to order based supply planning, get through inbound demand management, which is the planner's ability to override the backlog requested dates that IBPs being asked to solve for, uh, unconstrained supply planning solve, uh, across orders and qualified opportunities and forecasts, followed by a ability to understand based on the pegging uh, what uh, the caps are, the shortages are, what POs need to be expedited and so on, working with the suppliers to do that. And, and then taking a constrained response planning run to bake the supplier commit constraints into the sales order confirmations and the production plan and also then having some more uh, flexibility for the planners to publish confirmed dates differently than how IBP calculated. Taking these scheduled order dates, turning those into a revenue forecast, applying the full revenue recognition set of rules, understanding the gaps that we might have versus a target, and doing some what if simulations or large deals, et cetera, turning this into a overall performance trend forecast review for management. So some of the pieces themselves are standard, but the flavors applied for MTU are different. This is another view of the same picture where you can take the process and understand which IBP application response and supplier or SNOP are going to be used uh, to uh, map to this process. You should think of this as uh, to solve MTU in IBP, you will definitely need IBP response and supply order based planning both uh, of how we've solved it and where SAP is going roadmap wise. And Eric would cover this later. That's the key module to have, uh, which requires IBP SNOP. And that's where all the demand planning is happening. Given the uh, focus on uh, very uh, specific uh, uh, sales uh, order level variants, we, we don't see a lot of uh, MTS kind of demand planning features like promotion planning or demand sensing. Those things don't apply as much. So uh, we, we don't see IBP demand as useful, but definitely IBP SNOP. So if you uh, just understand the overall process, we take all the code specific configurations and sales opportunities being tracked in CRM into the sales forecasting process. We take a uh, segmented uh, set of history for statistical forecasting and marketing forecast process. Between sales and marketing and stat, we generate a consensus demand plan, use attached rates to explode it, to the inventory planning, safety stock review and approval, which feeds into the order-based supply planning. Also this consensus demand signal is flowing into the forecast consumption process and then uh, going into the supply planning piece. Supply planning is in response and supply order-based and you flow through the full cycle of uh, being the confirmations, the pegging, the gating factors, all the boxes in yellow are uh, part of the either cloud value now MTU extensions. So these are things that are not part of the standard that we have enhanced across multiple customers and are looking to now bring to market. So I will explain uh, some of these things later, but just at a high level intelligent alerting uh, changes the alerting paradigm uh, from a uh, date quantity disconnect oriented alert paradigm to a business rule definition based on pegging. So for example, you can say just a shortage isn't uh, the reason for me to, um, as a buyer, go talk to my suppliers. I first want to understand if that shortage is tied to a forecasted demand or a real demand. If it's a firm sales or is it for a key customer or based on the customer tiers, uh, what you're doing is you're taking all of your alerts and segmenting them into uh, various tiers and, and dealing with your most impactful, most hard problems of front. This uh, add-on for IBP and S4 or in e, uh, ECC is where a lot of this uh, magic has happened because sales orders with variant configuration in S4 or ECC are not supported to go to IBP standard. But uh, what we've done is uh, converted those into sales order specific material variants in the interface. These are dynamic parts, which the moment the order ship, the part drops off. So you don't have a master data accumulation proliferation problem, you just are using sales orders to show a different level of granularity only in IVP compared to S4. And the interface still works both ways. You can both send those orders up, plan them, and then bring them back. So when you're confirming sales orders, so you're generating planned orders against the uh, sales order that to S4, they remain a make-to-order variant configuration compliant one. 
So let me just uh, jump in some of these scenarios one at a time. Dynamic attached rates is where I would go first. Let's just uh, understand the problem statement quickly. You have uh, sales orders with unique configurations. For example, if these are uh, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 uh, orders that we've taken uh, going through, each has the same finished good uh, uh, came at uh, configurable product uh, on them, different customers, different requested quantities, different ship dates and so on. If you understand the world of variant configuration, the finished good one, which is a configurable key mat material, may have, uh, as Marcus was explaining, a super bomb uh, of uh, many uh, make to stock uh, sub assemblies, if you will, that uh, on an order by order basis, if you look at individual orders, these uh, 501, 2, 3, 4 explain, each time, if you notice, a given sales order has a subset and a very variable subset of this overall super bomb. So you have sub assembly one, three, and four here, one, two, uh, five, and six here, and so on. The picture I'm trying to paint here is that if you take a finished good one as a configurable product ID in uh, the ECC or S4 side, we assign it a dynamic material variable number, make it unique. Against that, we bring in this pillow material to say this FG1 MV12 has these four parts in it. And you can do this for all the orders in which let's say subassembly two is a component. So if you understand quantity six and two and nine adds up to quantity of 17 when you're looking at the subassembly two, right? And you can see none of the other orders had a subassembly two. So what it does is it allows us to now say on a last 12 months basis, uh, subassembly two has been ordered 17 out of 65 times, give it attach rate of saying, well, 26% is the attach rate. So if you're forecasting 100 units uh, for the KMAT configurable material next year, you know, you're gonna need 26 of subassembly two. So that's how we solve the variable problem of each order has a variable bill of material you couldn't just go and say, if I have 100 units in forecast that I should buy 100 parts for each of these, then that would not be a good idea. So hope that's clear. How to apply this to a demand forecast concept now that we have these uh, sub-assembly specific uh, attached rates understood. What we do is we take the shifted uh, shipment history, generate a statistical forecast, so we can now in the same months next year see both the last year history and the stat forecast. Let's say a product marketing person comes up with a forecast like this. If you look at subassembly one, which happened to have 100% attach rate, that's the base unit, that's always there. We are seeing that attach rate being 100%, everything that the marketing forecast had as six units is six at the subassembly one level as well. So this was finished good level forecast. This now you are at a subassembly level forecast. You're saying, six units required for subassembly one. However, if you look at subassembly two, remember the 26% attach rate. We have that 26% attach rate converting this six into a corresponding 1.6, right? So now you have a 26% of the overall finished good level demand. The key to understand here is uh, planners can also go and overwrite these attach rates. So they may say that going forward, I'm gonna, through my pricing, sell more of this option, less of it, I'm introducing new options, I'm retiring some. So they have full control on this attach rate. So 26 versus 30, you can see different quantities across months for the same finish. You can also, uh, as a third flavor, have independent demand for these sub-assemblies added to the uh, dependent demand that you calculated through your attach rate explosion. So if you look at 48% uh, attach rate, planner overriding it to 50, uh, six uh, becomes three as a result, 50% you add this one unit independent demand, three becomes four. So that's clear. And this allows you to uh, control how you're forecasting your uh, make to stock level sub assemblies in an overall MTO product. So in the interest of time, I will move to the next one quickly. This is the sales opportunity qualification and age forecasting. The concept is to say, uh, this this is a big problem we found uh, in make to order customers where they say, well, I have this uh, huge opportunity pipeline, not all are going to make it. I don't want to go plan each one of them. I also don't want to not plan any of them till orders come in. 
because the order response time isn't enough. I need to procure components in advance. And it becomes a guessing game to say which ones and how much. So what we've done is taking these opportunities, uh, understanding them through the same uh, unique material variant concept to say what is the opportunity specific form, what is the revenue and the margin, the win probability, and uh, understanding the full range of when the opportunity could come in and apply that in planning. So let's see one example, hope this becomes clearer. If uh, let's say in your uh, Salesforce system or SAP CRM system, you have three opportunities. Let's pick one of them, this one. So FG1, uh, and let's say this is with its unique POM coming out as dash MV1, two pieces required. It's forecasted to close with 90% probability in January. So we like that. And what we do is in January in an IVP view, we are saying this quantity two is going to give me $27,000 net revenue. Win probability is 90%. So planners uh, have a rule where anything more than 80% is going to become a fully qualified, fully planned for opportunity. The weight factor for it is one. If you look at the next one here, the win probability is only 25%. The rule is to say anything less than 30%, I am not going to factor into my supply planning. So this is a way to say the opportunity weight factor for that is zero. So I do not want to count this opportunity. And the third one, when the range is between 30 and 80%, we say, well, whatever the value on it is, you reduce the opportunity uh, quantity accordingly. So you can see 50% quantity of 10 has a weight factor of 50%. We do allow uh, planners sales team to override this. So they may say, well, uh, that's what the 50% uh, opportunity from the salesperson, but the supplier or the finance teams could say that they would like to go ahead and plan for seven. So what it does is it takes the first one, the quantity of two comes in fully because of the one weight factor. We've essentially taken the whole opportunity the next one, if you see this quantity of one has been reduced to zero. So meaning we are completely ignoring that opportunity till it matures further. And if you look at the third one, this quantity of 10 using this weight factor override of 0.7 has given you seven pieces. If you notice uh, with the 10 pieces, the net revenue was 187. It's only 131. So this goes for both sides, uh, the supply as well as the revenue. We can also have uh, some orders on top of these opportunities, so far as the salespeople are concerned, they could be saying, well, these orders are also mapped here, totaled up to the opportunities, and it gives the salespeople a default line to say what your sales forecast is going to look like. They can also overwrite and uh, introduce a higher overall sales forecast, which is their way of saying, I don't have an opportunity yet, in fact, or I haven't entered it in CRM but I know, and I'd like uh, supply teams to go plan based on four units, not three. So if this is clear, uh, let's uh, get on to the next one. This, uh, what I explained, only allowed us to take that 50% uh, uh, probability opportunity and uh, convert it to a seven quantity being planned, right? What it does not address, however, is uh, there is a point forecast based on opportunity close state saying it's gonna close in March. Well, uh, any sales guy knows that it may close in March or it may not, and that risk has to be understood, especially for our revenue forecasting angle. And what you're now able to do is put a range forecast on the close date to say, the sales guy can now say, well, although in CRM, I'm giving you a point forecast as a date in March. In reality, I am 50% confident that it'll happen in March. It could slide to April or even to May. And the revenue anchor that we propose is when we think the sales guy is saying we'll definitely have it. So not only are we reducing the quantity, now we're saying we think this should strike in May. We are allowing the finance team to now override it to say I'll definitely not call this revenue in Q1, but I also don't want to wait until May. So they, they put it here in April and that's how their revenue forecast is. So this allows uh, the teams to collaborate with each other, communicate the risk and, and bake a revenue forecast uh, in sync with both the opportunity probability, the revenue that they really want to realize. So you notice finance is forecasting 131 out of that 187 and they're doing it uh, later than March, that is in CRM. Yeah. So let's move to the next one. We have uh, 
a revenue forecasting concept uh, similar uh, to the range forecasting we did for the close state, but now more in sync with the post-production activities. Uh, so installation schedules uh, vary uh, quite a bit. Also, the customer may not be ready. Uh, the customer may not have funds, so there might be a series of challenges in uh, saying, yes, we have the machine. This is the production plan. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to automatically convert to revenue just because you have it. So look at uh, this problem again. If you have a sales order for a given customer, MV5, we're saying we're making three units of it. It's an X works kind of input term, 30 day transit time. X works means uh, by definition, the moment I ship it from my factory, I can recognize revenue. So this is what we are doing. We are saying, ask the install manager what the revenue forecast risk is and uh, the contract administrator what the risk is based on that propose an anchor and say the moment the customer is, let's say, unlikely to uh, agree to receiving the machine in February, but they are likely to receive it in March. So if you go based on that, we say, well, when we ship it in March, we would recognize the revenue in March right away, right? So these 59,400 is the revenue forecast in March. Contrast this with the order number three, which is where you have a delivered at place kind of input term, which means you have to get it to the customer site in order for it to count as revenue and with a 50 day transit time. Given this order, if you see the picture and let's say the install manager came back in saying, well, the order is confirmed to ship in 315, it's uh, from a installed range forecast perspective, it's going to be in April or in May. Contract administrator also is telling you that uh, the customer's ability to pay for this is also uh, maybe not in March, but they should be able to have the funds in April. So based on these two moving independent data sets, we propose a revenue anchor. Finance can override it, so they can override the May forecast to say, well, this will happen in April. Basically, they're saying to the other teams, make it happen in April, this is when we need the revenue. Now, if you take this into account that it's gonna ship in April with the 50 day uh, transit time, let's say the date says it will reach there in May, uh, based on the delivered at place in Kutam, we realize the revenue in May. This is different from the earlier example I painted where we realized the revenue the same. So this allows you uh, to uh, do some very precise calculations for a revenue forecasting uh, the full performance obligation, revenue recognition rules set can be recognized your income terms or transit times can be accounted for, and you can have full transparency into your revenue risk across all the stakeholders. Let's take a look at the next one, which is the purchase order based supplier collaboration. This is uh, a uh, peculiar situation where uh, make to order businesses, uh, they, they have uh, ways to stress the suppliers and get uh, products faster within lead time if need be. So they don't want to necessarily constrain the production plan and the sales order dates initially, but they want to go understand what the production plan is to service the sales orders and what the procurement plan needs to be to service the production plan. And then go work with the suppliers, especially where the procurement plan is looking to buy within the part lead time. And uh, most of the time they're able to, uh, through uh, pushing on the suppliers, through expediting, able to get the material they need only when they have a hard constraint that they just can't they want to stress the production plan and the sales order confirmations uh, ripple from there. So this ability to understand what is short, uh, which PO I need to expedite or raise, or even push out or reduce and be able to collaborate with the suppliers real time as you go through this planning process, this is what we've solved. So this uh, is order based planning scenario. The ones you saw earlier were all implemented at Varian. This one is uh, implemented at other customers and Varian maybe uh, when they go to phase two, they will. So just understand how this is working. This view, uh, as you can see, is an Excel add-in kind of view in IVP where you will have uh, the customer sales order product variant. Uh, so FG1 might be the number in uh, ECC or S4. You are gonna see it in IVP as this. And uh, you are now seeing an order required on 1222 is how the customers requested it. Right? Sales order requested quantity is 100. When we plan it in IVP, we find out uh, that the corresponding components, let's say there is a four day lead time to go convert components into sub-assemblies and then 
to the final assembly. So we are saying to the supplier, we need the components on 1218. And that's the requested quantity. Supplier request is 100. Let's say the supplier on a web-based planning view. Uh, this you can do it for key suppliers. So you can also uh, take these Excel templates, go offline, send it uh, via email, and receive supply feedback that way, or use a robust supply chain collaboration. All three options are there. But with an IBP, you can use web-based or Excel templates. If the supplier responds, yes, I can do it, and the buyer and the supplier uh, drop the response into the commit. This is what the supplier will receive a PO for. This uh, availability at the component level translates into a sales order level confirmation of you wanted it on 1222. Yes, you can have it on 1222 and nothing is late. This is a happy picture. Everyone's happy with this. Now see what happens if the customer now comes in uh, on 127. This was all last week uh, that we did the order receiving and uh, supplier collaboration to confirm the order. If uh, on 12.7, uh, uh, we see the customers now ask for this order to be delivered a week earlier, 12.15, we are now saying, okay, it's confirmed on 12.22, it's required on 12.15 and alert is raised. The supplier collaboration planning cycle uh, kicks in. Now you can see earlier, this was a no action and uh, no alert sort of situation. Now you see a sales order shortage and these alert types can be forecast related shortage or key customer shortage. So we can segment these alert, allow the uh, buyers and planners to easily understand which ones to prioritize. Action type to say, well, we are looking for that PO we just placed last week to be expedited. The PO, uh, as you remember, was on 1218 and confirmed there. And this information is now being tracked in a prior cycle set of key figures to say last cycle assuming it's a weekly cycle. What did we ask the supplier? What did they confirm? What is the current plan versus now what are we asking? So now we are asking in sync with this move, a four day earlier, we are asking these components on 12.11. Let's say the supplier comes back saying, well, sorry, no can do. I will give it to you all on 12.14. That's the earliest I can do. And let's say the buyer negotiates and, and pulls in some favors to say, well, at least give me 40 units uh, that uh, my customer needs right away. And then you can give me the 60 later. This uh, split commit now bubbles into the corresponding sales or a confirmation process. So this quantity of 100 that you needed is being confirmed as 40 units uh, when you wanted it and uh, remaining 60 units three days later. And this is how we are able to follow this uh, entire uh, sales order uh, production order, purchase order, full link chain, and all the moving parts around it, despite the variant configuration and using web-based planning allows suppliers to see any point in time, what the demand is, what the changes are from last cycle and collab. Let's just uh, cover uh, this uh, last one, which is a demand management scenario. So what's happening here is uh, planners uh, need to send more conservative dates to IBP, order-based planning. Uh, right now, the interface is very tight, whatever's the date on the s sales order. That's what's going over. And what planners want to do is send IBP a more aggressive date. So the factory is planning, let's say, by a time buffer, they're planning three or seven days earlier than the sales order really needs it. So in case there are any delays in the factory that the sales order confirmation isn't at risk. So let's take an example again. You are looking at uh, a sales order requested uh, on 1224. And this is a, a new order, let's say SO11 from customer rate, MV is 55 this time. And let's say uh, in a demand management screen, which is part of the value now extension that we have, the planner goes in and says, well, the requested ship date that IBP should plan for is 1220 and buying four days of safety buffer. Planners have the ability to write notes and comments to say, well, I've pulled in the IBB date by four days because of the giving uh, that the holidays are coming up. We don't want to have things around 12.24. So when the planner pulls in a date like this, this is the date that goes over to IBP. So IBP sees the sales order as requested date 12.20. IBP has uh, this date as a side FII field to say, what is the shift? Date in S4, but uh, the date IBP is planning with is 1220. If you uh, generate a planned order at this uh, finished good uh, material variant level to say, well, this is my final assembly on 1220th, 
And this requires, let's say, one of the components, uh, subassembly, the subassembly one, a planned order is generated for that as well. Let's say there's a one day lead time to do the final assembly. So this needs to be ready by 1219. So you can assemble by 1220 and ship the order. And let's say there is a purchase uh, requisition raised for a component needed to make subassembly one. And that is needed on 1216 because of the three day time to build subassembly. And there can be, as you can imagine, multiple sub-assemblies and multiple components. I'm just showing you one pegging chain to keep it simple. But you essentially now can see from your sales orders to multi-level bomb, all the planned orders and purchase acquisition elements and the need date uh, sort of propagating down. This, let's say you took, your, took this to your supplier to say, well, I need uh, 100 pieces of component one on 12.16. The supplier comes back and says, sorry, I can only give it to you on 12.18. And this now becomes a constraint. You are going to propagate that back up. So now your planned order is only confirmed on 12.21, two days late. You also have a one day delay in your finished code level assembly. And hence, uh, from here, you also have a one day delay in confirming your order. So the key is that what was required on 24, IBP was asked to plan with 20 and any delays when it comes back thinking it's late, you're not late because really the customer needed it on 1224. This ability also goes the other way. So when you take the date that we just came up with in IBP to say this can be done 1222, we are also on the outbound side back to S4, able to change and make this date even more conservative for whatever reason, if there are uh, delays expected on uh, the logistics front or if there are any reasons the buyer wants to uh, or the planner wants to uh, buy some more buffer from our acknowledgement perspective. What they do is they put a, and this is the manual override, right? So they are able to say this confirmed ship date is 1222 on the order, but let's tell S4 that it's 1228. So when S4 confirms and sends an order acknowledgement out to the customer, that will be 1228, this date, drops into the first commit date used for on-time delivery tracking. So the company is now setting up to measure, did we ship it by 1228 or not? This is buyer's uh, or planner's way of uh, managing uh, the risk in terms of uh, the supplier not providing components or time or the factory not finishing it. So 1228 is how we are progressing. Let's say that for whatever reason, uh, we find out there are additional factory labor constraints during the holidays, we just don't have enough people and IBP pushes the order completion date out to 1.4. This 1.4, when it uh, drops into the ship date field in uh, the outbound demand management, you can now see the first commit was 12.28, and this raises an alert. Anytime our confirmed ship date in S4 is later than the first commit, we are able to see that uh, we are going to uh, be shipping this order late, and hence uh, an alert is rate. You take that alert, you work around it as a uh, planner with the shop flow to say, well, arrange some additional labor during the holidays, we need to ship this order. And let's say they're able to pull it back to 1226. When they pull it back to 1226, let's say the planner goes back and still confirms this on 1228, which is what the first commit date was, and hence the order from on-time delivery tracking is on time. So if this makes sense, uh, what we've done is allowed uh, planners to both send a more aggressive date to IBP for planning purposes. So the planned orders, purchase racks are all driven based on that date. And also to the customer, they can turn around and uh, put a more conservative data. So those were the five scenarios. Uh, let's uh, just look at the uh, overall picture. Uh, if we go back up uh, from a demand planning perspective, Think of this slide as we are talking about what IBP standard capabilities are for MTO and what we have extended. So what you saw today was that we have dynamic attach rates. This is very important that those attach rates are not static and maintained once in a planning bomb in S4 and forgotten for six months or a year. The attach rates uh, we are able to calculate on a weekly monthly basis. So as the order mix changes, uh, every monthly cycle, the planners have the confidence that they are able to see how the attach rates have moved and plan with the most recent attach rates. And this is fully automated. Range forecasting, as I explained before, for close states and qualification of sales pipeline just allows you to develop a sales forecast with a much higher confidence. 
make to order world isn't a world where you could do a lot with the statistical forecast at the finished good level. We didn't cover this scenario today, but we are also able to calculate all the forecast value add by each stakeholder group and use that to automatically default consensus forecast. If you look at the operational supply planning, uh, as you might be familiar, there are a lot of options across time series and operational. Uh, SAP's direction is most of this uh, MTO world is going to be on the operational supply planning side. Uh, pegging, getting factors, web-based planning, uh, intelligent visibility, these are all standard things. What we saw today was, uh, this is the uh, secret sauce here, uh, the ability to put uh, product variants in IVP to work around the current uh, interface constraint. Uh, the ability to also take multi-level configurations across not just sales orders, but also sales opportunities. Be able to publish these MTO-based planned orders and purchase acquisitions back to S4 with fully linked chains, the way S4 MRP would have done it. The ability to collaborate with suppliers on a PO by PO basis and not just collaborate with an IBP, but at the click of a button, be able to mass update the POs back in S4. Business rules and packing based intelligent alerting. This is a topic for another webinar, but uh, I explained this at a high level that uh, buyers and planners uh, all have the benefit of knowing uh, a shortage, uh, how critical it is, how actionable it is. So even uh, business rules like if uh, something is a delay and it's more than 45 days out, don't bother me now, it's likely to change again. Or if something is uh, expedited and it's within the next four days, don't bother me because I probably won't be able to do anything. So it's kind of a way of filtering and uh, instead of getting thousands of alerts, be able to segment them, know which ones you will be able to action, which ones you want to action first and so on. Demand management, I already covered. Uh, we also have taken the standard sales order simulation capability and turned it around as a make to order. So just like you take a sales order, you specify all the characteristic attributes here. In a simulation world with an IVP, you are able to specify all the characteristic values and drive on the fly a product variant for sales order simulation. From a finance reconciliation perspective, uh, we talked about the revenue range forecasting for sales orders and this ability to take in terms performance obligations, revenue recognition rule sets all uh, to produce very accurate, very precise revenue forecast. So as your backlog is very volatile, it keeps moving left and right. Uh, your estimate of revenue, you can clearly see how it's changing on a day by day basis. So that's uh, what we had uh, just to sum it up. Uh, Key takeaways perspective, uh, MTO uh, compared to MTS is a much more complex land. Uh, there are complex challenges. Standard IBP currently does not cover all the scenarios. Uh, there is a roadmap Eric will be uh, going next, talking about how SAP is looking to cover them long-term. But uh, in terms of uh, the business challenges, the order-based planning and time series planning, we have uh, the key message I want you to take with you is that the MTO extension we have enables coverage across all of these scenarios that are on the roadmap for later, you can take advantage of uh, and, and move uh, with it now. Uh, the other key point I wanna make is, uh, this is not just uh, for IVP. If there are customers that do not have IVP and are on uh, S4 only and uh, want to do this with MRP, with the MRP strategy 56 characteristics planning, we've also been able to solve this problem of uh, attach rate based planning and other things. Uh, directly within MRP. Of course, you don't get the benefit of uh, constraint planning, capacity considerations, and some of the other uh, features that we covered here today, but the core uh, forecast uh, using characteristics uh, that, that you can support with MRP 56. So if there are customers who are interested in how to solve this on MRP side, this is the topic for another webinar. So that's all I had. I would like to uh, transition to Eric at this point. We will come back during the live Q&A be happy to take any questions there. Eric, please go ahead. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see this fine. Um, thanks, Ash, that was a very comprehensive review for that. And as you had mentioned in a nice segue for me um, to proceed forward into our roadmap, <clears throat> just a couple quick things. First, legal disclaimer. So many of you that have seen SAP presentations know that uh, anything forward-looking from a roadmap perspective is subject to change. That's the moral to the story. Uh, and I'll be presenting both the regular roadmap as well as um, the long-term roadmap for response and supply. 
Uh, one important note first, um, <clears throat> hopefully everyone's aware, earlier this year, SAP has moved to a digital roadmap. It's called the Roadmap Explorer. Uh, there's a link in here, or you can just Google it and you'll find it. So all of our innovations are categorized by the quarterly release that they'll come in for IBP, but they're captured on this digital Roadmap Explorer and no longer in this um, PDF file that used to be, that looked like this and could be downloaded. So I've just represented it this way. Just know that this is not out there anymore. You'll see this by quarterly release on the Roadmap Explorer. Um, but for today's discussion, let's review this. So hopefully everyone's aware that we do <clears throat> quarterly releases in IBP. Um, this is our kind of our, our best guess. Most of this stuff, at least in the shorter term, is more cast in stone. You may sit, see something shift <clears throat> one or two releases, but these are things that development has done or moved forward with. So there's a few key points here. And just as a, as a note first, um, when you see order-based planning up top, this is what Ash mentioned. We use the term order-based planning or operational supply planning synonymous. So that's SAP 7 planning area and all the functionality related to that. And then tactical supply planning is what we use the term or time series supply planning. That's a lot of the time series optimizer that many of you are familiar with. But today I just wanna focus on the order-based world as you'll see as I transition into the long-term roadmap. So we have a lot of things that have come out recently around deployment and distribution planning. Um, we have some interactive planning capabilities coming. We had a web UI earlier this year. Um, <clears throat> order creation, delete and changing is gonna be coming in the early releases as part of a Fiori app and then extending um, into something that we have called a planner's workspace topic for another day. Um, but we also have some stuff you can see functionality wise around product substitution on the finished good level for the optimizer and then the subsequent released around the heuristic. Um, one of the things that we've had released earlier this year in 2005, I think it was, or 2008, was this thing called switchable constraints. It's the ability to turn off a certain constraint. It was on a global level, so to speak, um, or a um, profile level before. And this allows the heuristic to run unabated, if you will. So now in the middle of next year, we're gonna have a switchable constraint at the object level. So you can actually define specifically which objects you want a constraint to be on. So this location or this set of resources versus all resources. Um, so this is important too, from a, from a usability perspective and algorithm side. Um, I highlighted one other thing here on the right-hand side, 2008, 2108, we're gonna come back to this synchronized planning. Hopefully everybody is aware um, that this year in August, um, in the 2008 release, we did our first synchronized planning. And what that is, is a tight integration to ePPDS and S4HANA. Um, it requires the October re release of the S4HANA on-premise, but there's a new capability that orders can go back from a key completion standpoint. We've added orders on both sides of the equation. So, so ERP S4 and IBP can understand both order types. And now there's a... Now we have a handover from an IBP planned order to an S4 planned order where PPDS picks it up and then goes ahead and uses it from a detailed scheduling capability and then brings that back to, um, to IBP, okay? So these are some of the highlights from a quarterly release perspective. You can see a lot of continuous improvement areas um, <clears throat> around order-based planning um, for that. We used to have a slide um, now called pr product directional update. This were things that we knew that we were gonna work on um, but we didn't have specific quarterly releases for that. So there's a lot on this, and this is what will lead to this long-term roadmap that I'll share with you in a second. Key takeaway here, um, I get asked this question all the time, especially from our install base or our partners, real-time integration like we had in the SIF. You'll see that coming in a second. Um, scheduling agreement, co-products, there's a lot on here. I've highlighted the couple big ticket items, characteristics-based planning with shelf life, which hold that thought, I'll show you in more detail what we have coming around that, all right? So without further ado, um, you will not find this on the Roadmap Explorer, by the way, since this, you can tell, is a yearly bucket. So it looks the same at the header, um, but this is a yearly bucket. Um, this is specifically around the area of order-based or operational supply planning. Um, this was published in February of 2020. We intend to publish another one <clears throat> in February release um, of 2021, which will shift the years. So there's, there's a lot on here. It's very meaty. So I want to mention a couple things just first and foremost. 
it's kind of hard to tell with this font, but there are things that are in italics. Those things that are, are that were in italics um, <clears throat> are new to this 2020 version. So they didn't exist on the long-term roadmap of 2019. Okay, so this was important. Um, this was based upon feedback from customer meetings, the customer network council in Waldorf that was held yearly, uh, different feedbacks from uh, industry colleagues, the field, et cetera. So we're constantly adapting to what we see in the marketplace changing, but there are some big ticket items on here that I'd like to highlight now. I already mentioned the production planning and detailed scheduling. That was the first one that got released. And as I mentioned, we have this coming further use cases from an integration perspective next year. There's the real near real-time integration. So internally, we call this quote unquote SIF-like. So this will be live inbound data and then perceivably live outbound data, at least as an option as well, like we had in the days of APO SMP. Um, one thing that is in italics you see here, this is a big ticket item. This is a configurable data model and a combined data model for supply and response. And no, that is not a typo. Officially, some people always say supply and response. Officially, the product is called response and supply. But the reason we, we have this highlighted here is we know that we have a planning area for our time series supply and we have a planning area for order based. Our intent is to bring this model together into one, again, a bigger topic for another day, but that the data, master data, transactional data, the semantic layer are all singing off the same sheet of music and we have all of that data. So time series or order base can use that same set of data instead of having it separated as it is today in two different planning areas in IVP. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes for that. Uh, the initial part of this is coming next year and then there's a couple phases, a topic for another day. I mentioned interactive planning already. I kind of touched on this infinite MRP-like heuristic. We might release another algorithm or it might end up being those switchable constraints if we can get the output of that looking like a regular MRP-like heuristic. But key takeaway here is once we get to this, it'll start to look very similar to what we've had from a um, SNP perspective because of the question a lot of times from customers and install bases, when can I go from what I have today versus uh, in APO versus what I can do in IBP? And that is a ad hoc uh, conversation or a case by case uh, discussion with regards to what specific functionality is being used. Okay, so um, that's a couple items. Here we are down the bottom. This is a big umbrella item. You see initial use case for characteristics based planning. You may see the acronym CBP. That's what we mean by this. Um, we started a co-innovation earlier this year with about 20-ish customers or so, 20 to 25 customers. CBP is a big umbrella. That means different things to different people. Um, some of the areas of focus, at least for the initial developments, we're looking at is shelf life planning. We're looking at attribute-based planning. This is something that we had in the apparel industry, AFS or FMS uh, before. And then we're looking at some of the validation capabilities and requirements around life sciences to say country of origin or validated resources. I can get this, but it has to be on a validated resource that needs a characteristic to be defined in there. So these are three of the initial use cases um, that we have coming. Keep your ears and eyes uh, posted for the update in February. Um, some things are happening behind the scenes here and maybe shifting a little bit. But along that, um, along that CBP, we also have, or I guess I should say in, in conjunction with make to order capability, there are basic or more generic, I think many of you are familiar with make to order planning capabilities. We had this in PPDS. Key takeaway here, we never had that in SNP. it was make to stock only. We wanna add that, but that takes into consideration some of the planning segments, okay? So we don't have this concept of a planning segment like we used to have, so that needs to be built and developed. We have the pegging capability already, but being able to take that pegging and say, I have sales orders for the same make to order item, but they're separate sales orders and those two things shouldn't cross, right? The pegging relationship should be the same and separated. I mean, same within each other, but not overlapping each other like make to stock. So this is something that we're looking at for make to order. As we move more forward, you can see here some of the more advanced CBP topics around planning configurable products. This is what was kind of discussed today from a Avarian perspective. Um, as you heard, they, met, they mentioned <clears throat> the use of KMAP materials. So this is variant config. This is a very complex topic. Anybody that's used this in the past will realize this. So my take of this as we move forward with CBP is we're gonna do those initial use cases first, <clears throat> and then we'll come back around from a configurable product planning perspective. So 
On here, you can tell that we've got a lot of things going on. We've made great progress up until this point from an operational order-based planning perspective. We've added the optimizer algorithm. Uh, we're adding more functionality around that, as you can see, telescopic planning, result monitors, other things behind the scenes in terms of resources, et cetera. Um, we've also done a lot with distribution and deployment planning. From my perspective, having used APO 20 plus years ago, um, we're very close to the deployment planning capabilities that it had, but then we're taking the capabilities, as you see on this long-term roadmap, into the future um, with regards to things that we didn't have in our historic product, like make-to-order, characteristics-based planning, support for variant config, et cetera. So these are the big ticket items that are happening inside of response and supply, particularly on the operational base side. And I wanna make sure that I, I stop now and we are able to open the phone line, I think for the last seven minutes or so for questions. Thanks, Eric, that was great. I, I do want to just uh, move quickly to the uh, final slide here. And uh, we will definitely launch the Q&A right in but uh, there is a survey at the end of the webinar. So when the webinar ends, you will have a survey pop up. Please make sure to fill that survey out. Let us know. Uh, we are uh, offering a four hour complimentary discovery workshop. So if, uh, and irrespective of where you are, you're evaluating IVP or implementing and, and uh, or looking to enhance post-go live, et cetera. Uh, we, we would be happy to talk to you to help you understand how to get more value from your asset. And this is uh, just in general, uh, we've been able to implement IVP this year in three to four months time frame. Uh, you saw the timeline on uh, variance slide, despite all the complexity, very high complexity variables still finish that project in five months. So this is what we're trying to do, uh, deliver innovation with speed in, in a very cost-effective manner. Uh, we, we are able to do almost 80, 90% of the work offshore. And, and uh, especially in this COVID time, it has been very effective delivery model working around the clock and be able to crunch more timelines and, and the overall cost. So I would just uh, give you at this point, uh, you could let folks know how to uh, unmute themselves what the process is and if anyone has questions. Okay, so if anyone would like to get started, you can raise your hand and request to unmute yourself now. So I see a question here while we're waiting uh, in ECCPP, we had collective orders. Uh, just uh, this is something we ran into where when orders are sent from uh, IBP, uh, you don't get the kind of collective order uh, construct that you get out of the S4 MRP. So this is something we've been able to establish also uh, through a mass confirmation functionality that we've developed where uh, as you backflash the highest level finish good uh, production order, all the lower level uh, orders are automatically uh, condition confirmed and, and back flushed as well. So we were able to achieve what collective order does in S4 standard uh, with a set of orders and order network published from IP. Uh, Eric, maybe you wanna talk about if there's an equivalent in the embedded PPDS for this? I mean, ePPDS, e in short answer, ePPDS is the same as PPDS capability. It was just ported from APO to uh, ERP to S4HANA. So anything that existed in there for like 98% of the capabilities that existed there will exist in the ePPDS. There's a simplification list uh, that there's an OSS note out there. If you'd like to see that note, you can send me an email um, and I can send it to you or the, the note number to you that shows some of the things that were removed from this. Uh, in short, basically it was anything that had to do with SNP. So like the SNP order conversion, we don't support PPMs anymore. They moved to P, uh, PDSs only. There, the deployment function in PPDS was, was removed. So an, anything like that. So. <clears throat> Eric, I'm seeing another one here. Uh, hope you can see it on your Q&A uh, 
text as well, the IBP and S4 HANA, MRP planning area mandatory in S4. Do we have to wait end of 2021 for it? Yeah, I think this, um, you know, I think this question may have come up in another session, if that's right, Christine, if I recall correctly. Um, and I had suggested that you send me an email. I'll have to check with the colleagues on that uh, as far as the capabilities and the timing. We have the capability to do this integration between IBP and S4HANA ePPDS today or as of this past fall. Um, we do not have MRP planning areas inside of IBP yet. It's something that's on the roadmap that's coming. Um, I think you may have caught it there, but um, that's not developed yet. So MRP area support is a future item for IBP. And this is something we also run into within S4 also, where if you're trying to do characteristics based planning uh, like MRP 56, uh, then uh, the MRP areas, which are more made to stop, don't uh, integrate very well. And we've been able to enhance around that also to say, you can do MRP 56 characteristics based planning and still get MRP area storage location level purchase acquisitions through some dynamic splitting of purchase racks uh, that we do after the MRP runs. So like I said, topic for another webinar, but if you are interested in seeing at least how to take care of all of that in S4, uh, please reach out to us. Okay, so Kibi, are you seeing any, any questions at this point before we wrap up the webinar? I do see a question from Jay, uh, but I, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty with promoting him to a... Okay, I just allowed him. Jay, please go ahead. Okay, there we go. Jay, if you can hear us, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, uh, just please type it. It might be easier. We can uh, take care of it. Otherwise, uh, you can reach out to us afterwards. Jay, we're happy to answer. So Gabby, we are right at the bottom of the hour. So I think uh, to be respectful of people's time, we can uh, close this webinar. So please go ahead with your final comments. Okay. Um, let me... So Gibby, that's okay. If uh, you're having some challenges there, we just thanks folks uh, for your time. Uh, really appreciate the uh, hour and a half is a lot these days. So appreciate your uh, time here and uh, be happy to help any way uh, we can. Just uh, feel free to reach out. Please do give us some feedback on the webinar. We will post uh, the uh, recording link and uh, the PDF tag shortly, uh, send it to all the attendees, of course, but it will be publicly available on our website, on SAP's website. I will also send it out through LinkedIn. So uh, Kevin, uh, Marcus, thank you very much for your support and uh, time here. Eric, thanks uh, for your support and roadmap as well. And uh, thanks folks, talk to you soon.